And just to kind of go over that narrative with you, just to get us up to speed to where we're going to be in chapter 7 this week. Um, Jesus, as he did regularly, was trying to get alone. He was trying to find what the text calls a deserted place. So you're in the region of Galilee. You have these beautiful mountains surrounding this freshwater lake. And Jesus is trying to go on a boat to a place where there's no villages, where there's no cities, trying to get away from the Gennesaret, trying to get away from Tiberias, places where they're uninhabited. And so he gets into the boat, but 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 now what happens? <laughs> it says the people that was with him saw the direction that the boat was going, right? So just reviewing here this morning. They saw the direction that the boat was going, and they beat Jesus to the location by going there on foot. And by the time Jesus comes up on the shore, there are thousands of people already gathered in, waiting to hear what Jesus is going to say. Now, if Jesus were like all of us, thank God he showed us what it means to be selfless and to think about others. But honestly, if he were like all of us, he'd be stepping off that boat, trying to find a deserted place, and here are all of these needy people again. And look, even for really strong extroverts like me, I still have a people quotient, right? I've got this quota, and once it is fulfilled for that day, I need to not be around people anymore, okay? Jesus had been ministering and ministering and ministering, and when he gets off the boat, he sees the crowd gathered there. What does he do? The scripture says his heart was filled with compassion for them. And out of his compassion for them, Jesus begins to teach again the gospel of the kingdom, begins to minister the precepts of the kingdom to them again. And he expends himself all the way into the evening. The scripture says prior to that, they had not even had leisure to even eat. So Jesus is going on no food. He is preaching to the people, and the disciples are starting to get hangry, I believe, okay? So they go to Jesus, and they say, look at this huge crowd that you have. It's on into the evening now. Jesus, send them out into the villages to get something to eat. And Jesus says, well, why don't you feed them? And the disciples say, oh, yeah, Jesus. Yeah, we're going to spend several years' worth of salary just to go out and feed all these people. What are you thinking? Jesus said, well, what do you have? And you know the rest of the story, right? I'm not going to go over all of it this morning since I'm just reviewing, but they, they come back to Jesus and say, well, we've, we've come up with five loaves and two fish. And Jesus shows them that when you bring to him what you have and you're faithful to do that, he can take what you have and he can multiply it and he can make great things out of it. So they feed over 5,000 people because the 5,000 was just counting men. That wasn't even counting women and children. They probably fed into the neighborhood of 15 to 20,000. And as he was feeding all of these people, God just kept multiplying in the miracle that happened there. Well, finally, uh, they're, they're going to get back on the boat again. And Jesus says, okay, finally I'm away from all the crowds. You guys get on the boat. You guys going over to the other side. I'm going to stay here in a desolate place. And I'm going to be alone for a little bit. Well, once again, Jesus sees people who need him because the disciples are rowing against these winds. And they've got the oars out, and he sees that they need his help. Well, Jesus doesn't have a boat on the shore, so what does he do? Well, he's the divine son of God, right? He does what the divine son of God does. He just walks on top of the water, and he starts going out to the boat. And the scripture says, and I think this was kind of a test for the disciples. He would have even passed by them. But they called out, and Jesus stopped, and he entered the boat, and the scripture says that the winds ceased. Everybody was amazed at what had just happened. Go further to the next episode. I sure did give Maggie a lot to preach on last week, didn't I? Sorry, Maggie. Uh, but the next episode was that Jesus is finally on the other side of the lake, and people are coming around him, and by this time they had heard about the woman with the hemorrhage. And they had heard that all she had done was touch the hem of his garment. Remember that story? And so people were now saying, let's go and touch the hem of his garment. And the scripture says that many people got healed as they were trying to replicate that miracle. So here brings us up to speed to Mark chapter 7. Now in Mark chapter 7, this is where Jesus is going to have his second major run-in with the scribes and with the Pharisees. His second major run-in. Do you remember the first one? It was in chapter 3. They had come to him, probably somewhere around Capernaum, 
And they were beginning to spread slander about him. Now, these guys came down from Jerusalem. I want you to remember that no matter which direction you depart Jerusalem from, you're always said to be going down, right? Because not only was it a pretty high elevation compared to the rest of Israel, it's also the holy city. So you're always ascending to Jerusalem and you're descending when you're leaving there. So the scripture says they came down from Jerusalem. Here's these like pious, hierarchical, elite guys coming into the countryside. Now, what are they doing there? Well, I think they must have been an official delegation sent there because you've got to understand, there was no other reason for these elite guys to be coming among the hicks of Galilee. That's what you got to know about Galilee. These people were hicks. They were country people. They weren't from Jerusalem. They weren't from the cities. They were in the countryside. So why is this delegation there? Well, they come to discredit Jesus because they're concerned about all of the fame and all of the popularity of what Jesus is accomplishing in Galilee. And so they're looking for any way to discredit him. Well, they know they can't deny his miracles. And so what do they do in in Mark chapter 3? They begin to spread the slander, not directly to Jesus' face, but behind his back. They begin to slander him and say, he's casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, which was a way of saying by the power of Satan himself. Now, Jesus spars with them in that moment and calls them out for such a ridiculous statement. But it looks like this was a regular practice of the hierarchy in Jerusalem. You guys go to to Galilee and you check out what Jesus is doing. So as we come to the passage here this morning that you had read for you, you understand that when the Pharisees are asking this question, and when the Pharisees are looking to Jesus about this whole hand washing thing. You know that they're not really interested in getting an answer from Jesus, right? You understand that they are there to find fault. They are there to try to criticize Jesus. And see, here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus, we read in the gospels, he was quick witted. He was very sharp. He knew how to answer with a question that would cause the person's mind to be all wrapped up like a pretzel to where they couldn't even answer him. He was a master rhetorician, so they knew that they weren't just going to pull one over on Jesus. So they go, you know, now Jesus, now now he's really sharp. Jesus is not only intellectual, but he's got the heart of the people. Jesus is sharp-witted. Jesus is a master of rhetoric. Jesus is a fantastic teacher. He's going to be really hard to trip up. But hey, (laughs) get a load of those 12 guys behind him. These old country bumpkins that are following Jesus around. The Pharisees are looking at these guys. They're like, man, they're a bunch of dum-dums. We could trip them up easily. Here's what we'll do. We'll watch them a little more closely, and I guarantee you we'll see them tripping up somewhere. And when we do, we'll bring it to the attention of the people, and then that will effectively discredit Jesus because the ones who are his closest followers are going to be an embarrassment to them. Well, it didn't take them long to find something to criticize Jesus' disciples about because these guys were not washing their hands before they ate. Now, you have to understand about the first century. They didn't know anything about germs, okay? They didn't know that you needed to wash your hands before you eat. They didn't know that you carried germs and disease that way. And so here was the thing. For the Pharisees to call out the disciples for not washing their hands, it was all about their not being ritually pure according to Jewish tradition. You see, this is what the Pharisees said. Why do they not observe the washing of hands, it says in verse 5, according to the tradition of the elders. Now, I want to bring something to your attention. Did they say, why do they not wash their hands according to Scripture? No, they said, why do they not wash their hands according to the tradition of the elders? Because the fact was this. Scripture in the book of Exodus, in the Torah, does talk about hand-washing rituals. But you know who they were for? Not for all the people. They were for the priests who were ministering in the temple. And in fact, they were for those priests when they were on duty, not even necessarily when they were at home, but when they were on duty before they would go to temple ritual, they would have to purify, actually cleanse their whole body. And so this was the law of the Torah, but the traditions, which was something different, was applying that law, which was for priests, to everybody. 
And effectively, what they were doing is they were adding to God's word. They were adding to the law of Moses, and they were making things more burdensome on the people through the tradition of the elders. Well, as you're going to see here in a moment, Jesus had no time for traditions. Now, you can actually still read some of these today, which are compiled in what we call the Babylonian Talmud which is a document that was compiled sometime after Jesus, but most would agree that it still accurately reflects somewhat some of these traditions. But here's what we're going to see in the Pharisees this morning. What we're going to see in the Pharisees is they are an example of what happens when you elevate the traditions of human beings almost to the same level that you elevate the Word of God. You see, I'm thankful for tradition. I'm thankful that we can look back to history and, and, and sit and read the scriptures and then also read the writings of these men who lived after the time of the Bible. You know, certainly we, we read John Wesley's writings and we say, wow, what a powerful man of God. But, but we would never elevate what he says to what scripture says. Of course, we love to read Thomas Aquinas and all of those middle evil, medieval scholastics and, and what they were saying, but we would never elevate what they say to the Word of God. Augustine, never would we elevate what he says to the Word of God, but he said some amazing things. Tradition is good, but we hold up the Scripture as our final and complete authority. So Jesus is, is going to challenge them on this whole idea of tradition. And this is where the controversy is going to lie. When Jesus challenges them on whom has the real authority to interpret God's law. Is it the rabbis or was it someone else? In a moment, Jesus is going to settle that debate. Just get ready. I think he's going to say something that actually may even shock church people if you have never really contemplated what he said before. But for now, what tactic does he use? The first thing he does is he exposes the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. So when he connects back to what they're saying with the law, he quotes Isaiah 29 and verse 13 to them. And this is what that says. It's recorded here in verse 6. He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Now what's going on right there? Well, first of all, let's look at what the prophet was saying. The prophet Isaiah that Jesus quotes, and he applies his words to the situation with the Pharisees. The prophet was saying that there is a toxic form of religion. There is a toxic form of religion where people learn all the right things to say. Maybe when they get in a room full of Christians, they know what topics you bring up, which ones you don't. They're very polished in their approach. They're very, they look very good in their outward appearance. I mean, they follow the model of what it looks like to be a Christian, whatever that means to them and in their culture and in their society. And they've got it down pat and they look good and they've got every I dotted and they've got every T crossed. But the prophet says, your heart is far from me. Oh, sure, it's, talk is cheap. It's easy to say I'm a Christian. It's easy to honor God with your lips, especially in a place like upstate South Carolina where there is a culture of Christianity, where people have learned the language of church. They've learned to talk church with people. And yet at the same time, that doesn't say anything about the condition of their heart. So, Jesus quotes Isaiah to them. He applies this toxic form of spirituality, and he calls them hypocrites. Now, that word hypocrite, hypocrites in the, in the Greek, that was a word used for somebody play-acting on a stage behind a mask. He says, you are hiding behind your religiosity. You're hiding behind your traditions. You're hiding behind your form of religion. And this is what Jesus is about to expose in them. You are neglecting the highest law of all, which is the law of love. Now, how were they doing that? What evidence did Jesus have that these men were hypocrites? And why did he call them out for it? Well, Jesus knew a little something about them. 
He knew that while they would stick to their traditions when it suited them, they would find legal loopholes when it didn't suit them. For instance, the law of Moses is plain. It comes right out of the Ten Commandments. You probably already know because you've read the text this morning. What is the one that Jesus quotes? It says, honor your father and mother. That's what the Ten Commandments say. That's as clear as crystal. That's as old as time. You are to honor your father and mother. Well, they didn't want to. They didn't want to take care of their father and mother. So they figured out, listen, a pious, religious way to get out of doing what's right. Can you believe that? They figured out how to use religion to get out of doing the right thing. Because this is what they said to their father and mother. They said, well, you know, I I was going to help you. And I, you know, I've got a little money stored back here, and, and I, I was going to try to help, but, but see, whatever money that I was going to help you with, I, I've already given it to God. And so it's Corbin, which is uh, the Aramaic word for it is already given as an offering. So I'm sorry. See, the fact is they didn't want to help their mom and dad. They didn't have a heart to help their mom and dad. They didn't have a heart to obey the commandments of Moses. And so they used a religious loophole because after all, who's going to come against us for wanting to give an offering to the temple of God? Well, what did the prophet say? You think that offering is worship? The prophet said that is in vain. That worship is in vain. Listen, if doing service for God causes you to neglect people, God doesn't want your service. God doesn't want your worship. If it causes you to neglect people, if it causes you to neglect those that are right before you, because Jesus said, if you can't love your brother whom you have seen, how could you say you love God whom you can't see? If our religion causes us to neglect the people that God has put in our lives, what good is our religion? I'm going to tell you what James said about that kind of religion. It's worthless. It is dead. It is in vain. That's what Jesus was saying to these Pharisees. Your lip service means Nothing to God. Now, I can just imagine Jesus in this scenario. And this is when it's really helpful and important to remember the humanity of Jesus. Jesus grew up as a young, poor boy in Galilee. We see Joseph nowhere in the narratives of Jesus' ministry. He is only early in the birth narratives. He is nowhere in the narratives of Jesus' ministry. He was almost certainly dead at the time that Jesus was ministering. Jesus was the man of the house. Jesus was the primary caretaker for his mother Mary. And they came from one of the poorest of the poor villages in Nazareth. I mean, Galilee was considered backwood country enough. But the fact that Nazareth was one of the smallest villages in in Galilee, and the fact that it had the poorest of the poor people there. And so Jesus grew up as a young man who very early, very, very much prematurely had to become the man of the house. Jesus had to get up every morning, put his sandals and his tunic on, and go out to work for his mother. Jesus would come in tired, And he would take his sandals and his tunic off. He'd go to bed tired. He'd get up tired the next morning. Every day, Jesus would get up and he would go to work. This is the part of Jesus that you don't often think about before his ministry. A working man, the head of the household, the firstborn, taking care of and honoring his mother. And then you can imagine Jesus at some point throughout the time because he knew about the practice of these Pharisees, evidently. At some point or another, he learned oh, I guess there's another class of people in Jerusalem. And they can get out of their responsibilities. And they're pampered. See, Jesus was a country boy. And they're wealthy. And they're elite. And they live in the city. And they are getting out of their responsibilities. And here I am with calloused hands, weary eyes, with a bad back. And Jesus was working. So I believe that Jesus blood boiled on that day because Jesus was a human being. And I believe Jesus was disgusted with these beautiful robes and these pious people that 
were trying to talk about how, how particular they were about the law, they would always wash their hands. And Jesus is looking at them with disgust. People that wouldn't even take care of their parents. And they would talk about him in this way. So he answers with biting sarcasm. Jesus was sarcastic. He says, verse 9, Well, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. And then he begins to lay out the case against them in which they are neglecting their family. He is telling them what maybe some of us need to hear. Your lip service means nothing to God, and many a so-called Christian has hid behind pious rhetoric while abandoning the heart behind the laws. What a devastating critique. These words from Jesus telling them that they are nullifying God's law with their traditions. Wow. Now, it would probably make sense to most people here, including myself. You would probably expect Jesus here to be a really good Protestant. <laughs> but the fact is, Jesus wasn't a Protestant. He, you know, that nobody knew what a Protestant was back then. But you'd expect him to be a good Protestant right here and say, so what you need to do, folks is you need to stop it with the traditions of man and you need to go back to the Bible, right? Just like Martin Luther said, just go back to the Bible, Bible alone. And I'm a Protestant and I have reasons for being one, but leaving that aside for right now, notice what Jesus says to them. He does not say, okay, so forget the traditions and go back to the Bible. This, this is actually what he says. He says something way more radical and way more shocking about that when he talks than that when he talks about this, uh, this issue with traditions. In verses 14 through 15, he will say this. He says, crowd, come here, listen. Everybody listen to me. All of you understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things which come out are what defile. Now, we know that Jesus was talking about food and dietary laws. Now, in case you're not following me with what's going on here, let me bring you up to speed. Number one, Jesus is challenging the authority of the Pharisees and the scribes. Now, the people are like, hey, we can get behind that because, hey, we're country folk from Galilee. And we don't like them either. All right. Then the scribes and the Pharisees are like, hey, Jesus isn't just challenging us. He's challenging the traditions of the elders. And the people are kind of like, oh, that's, oh, well, that's, yeah, that's a little more serious if he does that. Now, Jesus, you would have been on safe ground if you would have just stopped right there. If you would have just stopped with traditionalism, if you would have just stopped with, you know, like defeating the Pharisees verbally and like taking them to the woodshed like you just did. Everybody would have been behind you. You would have lost nobody. Jesus, you lost everybody when you nullified the dietary laws of Moses. Because Jesus, <laughs> this, this wasn't the tradition of man. This was the Torah. This was the word of God. You've, you, Jesus, have taken it a step too far. It is no wonder why his disciples were freaking out when they got alone in private in the house later. What are you doing? Jesus, we're behind you in challenging these Pharisee guys, but, but you just went to the law of Moses and it sounded like you were correcting it and giving us a different interpretation of it. See, I'm telling you right now, Jesus did something shocking, not something like you'd normally expect. But Jesus also did something we dare not do. Because Jesus showed himself to be the living word of God who has authority even over the written word word of God. See, the debate wasn't whether or not there should be an authoritative interpretation of the Old Testament. I want to make sure you understood what I just said. Please listen. Write it down if you're taking notes. The debate was not over whether there should be an authoritative interpretation of the Old Testament. The debate was who had the authority to interpret the Old Testament. Jesus, as the living word of God, could give us the true intent behind what the Father's heart was for the law. Jesus was free in any way as the living Word of God to take the written Word and say, you think it means this, it means something different. 
You've always believed it means this. It may look to your eyes like it clearly means this. I'm telling you, as the living Word of God, as the supreme revelation of God, as the final revelation of God, this is what it means. And when Jesus helps you understand the Old Testament, you go with what Jesus says. In fact, that's a great principle as you're studying through the Bible. As you're coming upon difficult passages that cause you internal wrestling that you don't understand what God is trying to do or seeking to communicate, you can go to Jesus and read it through His lens and you will be helped greatly. He's the supreme revelation above any other. He's making a shocking claim. The rabbis aren't authoritative. I am. What I say is how you interpret the law. So, as you can imagine, his disciples are mortified. He's just nullified the dietary laws that they've held to for centuries. But the main thing I want you to remember is Jesus is revealing the true intent of the Father behind the Old Testament. But in revealing this, there is a very practical lesson for all of us today. Very practical lesson for all of us. And here's what I want you to get. There is nothing external to you that can, number one, make you sin, or number two, prove your righteousness. That's the practical lesson that we get out of Jesus' challenge of the Pharisees. Nothing external. Let's talk about that first point. Nothing external can make you sin. It's not what comes into a man, Jesus said. It's not what he takes in from the outside. It's what comes out. It's what starts in the heart. Sin starts internally. Are there temptations outside? Yes. Guess what, folks? Jesus was tempted. And if Jesus had to face temptations from the outside, what makes you think you're going to be exempt from temptations on the outside? There will always be this side of eternity, temptations that are external to you. But the question is, how prepared is your heart for those temptations when they come? And what measures are you taking to overcome them? Again, it's not what comes in it's what starts in the heart and comes out. That's where the problem lies. You are going to take in things that you should have never had to take in. Now, before I even say this, is it important to put measures and safeguards in your life in order to try to avoid things that you know are going to cause you to stumble? Absolutely. There's, there's numbers in your phone you need to delete right now. You need to have some more accountability in your life. There are, there are things that you need to confess. There are things that you need to have taken care of. And I believe in accountability. My family, my wife and I, we practice accountability. And yet at the same time, you also need to understand that there is no amount of outward measures that you can take that will ultimately help you avoid every single temptation that will ever come your way. It is not possible. So what must there be in order to help us overcome these sins that Jesus will list off? Pride, avarice, malice, lust, envy, deceit, all of these things. How can we overcome these things? It starts at the heart level. That's where it all begins. The words of James are so important here. James 1, 14 through 15, he teaches us this. But one is tempted, listen, by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. And then when that desire, remember again, the internal desire, when that has conceived, it gives birth to sin, which is the outward outworking of the internal desire that is not in line with God's word or his will. It gives birth to sin, and that sin, when it is fully growth, gives birth to what? The wages of sin is death. Where does sin start? Does it start with that thing that your eyes are saying that you shouldn't be? Is that where sin starts? Not according to Jesus, not according to James. Does it start with those things that you hear 
That gossip, that backbiting that is so tempting to just join into, is that where sin starts? No, according to Jesus and according to James, it starts at the level of our desires. So if you want to talk about living a life of victorious freedom over sin, you have to talk about God changing you at the level of desire. God changed my heart. God transformed my desires. Let me desire only the things that you want in my life. God, pour your love so deep into my heart so that every Everything else gets pushed out, and then you will be someone who, when the external comes, when the temptation is in your face, the desires have already changed. If the desire for those things is there, there is no amount of behavior modification that is ever going to work. People have tried. People have tried to just be religious by creating systems that, that modify behavior. Never works. It has to be at the heart level. And, and for that second point that really got at the Pharisees, Nothing external to you can prove your righteousness. Not your shallow words, not how you dress, not how you carry yourself. Those are the easiest things to fake. Anybody can pick up on, oh, okay, this is Christian culture. I have to act like this. And when I get around evangelicals, I have to act like this. And when I get around fundamentalists, I have to act like this. And when I get around Catholics, I have to act like this. And when I get around Orthodox, I have to act like this. And anybody can take any branch of Christian culture and say, okay, I can figure out the, I can code switch, I can, I can talk the talk, I can, I can figure it out. That's the easiest stuff. But there is, in truth, nothing external that can create in you righteousness. The Pharisees needed some kind of justification within the law in order to neglect their parents. But it was all about outward factors. Imagine if the Pharisees' internal life had been right, if their heart was right. They wouldn't have been looking for a legal loophole. They would have taken care of their parents. Their internal life was what mattered. 